G'day everyone and welcome back to this Hidden Gems Share Cafe webinar. Always appreciate your Friday time. Um, nothing really from us today other than there's plenty of rumours circulating out of the West in regards to Hot Copper and the Market Herald. So let's keep an eye on that. Um, we're going to make a start straight away. Don't forget to ask questions. Type in the Q&A box provided and we'll get to those questions one way or another. So let's make a start with IOU pay, ASX code IOU, of course, market cap around $27 million. We have with us Paul Russell, who's the executive director. The company provides fintech and digital commerce software and services in Southeast Asia that enable institutional customers to securely authenticate end user customers and process banking, purchase and payment transactions. Paul, thanks for your time. Over to you. Thanks very much, Tim. It's great to be here. Uh, the presentation today is largely an extract from our business strategy update, which we announced on the 21st of July this year. So if people want to look at some more detail, um, they should go refer back to that and our other announcements. If we just start on slide three, um, IU Pay is a fintech business listed in Australia, but based in Malaysia. We've been operating for nearly 20 years, providing secure digital payment processing for banks, telcos, and major corporates in Malaysia and Indonesia. The company is focused on large communities of low risk consumers and merchants, which has led us to establish a highly scalable market leading BNPL platform servicing Malaysia. And we're seeking to expand throughout Southeast Asia. Our goal is to be one of the leading digital transaction processes in the large and growing cashless economies of Southeast Asia. Next slide. Over its 20 year history, the company has established a number of core capabilities that set the foundation for successful growth. We have developed a trusted and secure technology platform, a highly targeted customer acquisition plan and specific digital marketing strategies. We have a sophisticated credit and risk management system and an experienced senior management team with expertise in wholesale debt funding, corporate finance and m a This has led us to a number of highlights and achievements over the past 12 months. Next slide. IU's base business continues to perform strongly, reflecting the fundamental shift in consumer behaviours towards digital transactions. There are now over 350 million digital consumers in Southeast Asia, and this number continues to grow. However, credit is difficult to obtain, which is providing opportunities for BNPL and other consumer finance products. As a result, the company has launched its My IOU BNPL service in June 2021 and made a strategic investment in IDSB, one of Malaysia's largest finance companies. IU Pay is focused on product innovation to maintain market leadership, provide access to new customers, and to develop new revenue streams. Next slide. The business is very much focused on a measured approach to sustainable growth. You there, Paul? You seem to have uh, frozen, frozen screen by any chance? Looks like uh, we may have an internet issue there. We might look to move forward. Let's make a start. Uh, we'll go to IntelliHR. Okay, next up, we've got IntelliHR, got an ASX code of IHR, market cap of around $20 million. We've got Matt Donovan, Donovan with us. Hopefully we have Matt Donovan with us, who's the executive chairman. Uh, the company is an intelligent people platform empowering global HR leaders to create an inclusive, engaging, performing and aligned working culture. Are you there? Thank you for being available, Matt. We had some technical issues. Um, over to you, thank you. No problem. Uh, thank you for the chance to present uh, IntelliHR today. Um, if you could just go through a couple of slides here. So in, for those who don't know IntelliHR, we are uh, the intelligent people platform that empowers HR and business leaders to make more intelligent people decisions. Um, move forward one. Uh, the, what we help businesses do is to bring people into the business, keep them in uh, an area of profitable performance as an employee, 
help you identify if there are moments where that employee needs to be re-engaged um, and can be turned around and returned to uh, a more peak performance um, uh, within the business or help you uh, offboard people from your business uh, if they're becoming um, uh, unprofitable in the way that they're um, contributing to the business. If you can go forward one. Um, so IntelliHR is a, is a next generation uh, HRIS or HCM. You'll hear both of those terms in the market um, that puts people and culture at the core of a business. I think we've all seen through COVID um, the return of the importance of having people right at the heart of your business strategy. And what we do is we come into a business and we can sit and pull the data from your productivity tools, your payroll system, your hiring and recruitment system, your learning and development tools, and create for you a single source of data truth on every employee in the business. Um, the pillars of the product, it's built around intelligent, human, empowering, and secure. Um, we're a business that was born of HR. We were born in uh, Brisbane, in Queensland. Um, we now have people um, in a number of cities, uh, Melbourne, Auckland, London, Manchester, Toronto, uh, and Sydney, where I, where I am. Um, but it's a business that's built on analytics and visualization of data. Uh, it does the core um, HR functions of engagement and performance uh, to allow you to connect to people, onboard your people, help managers manage people across uh, this new hybrid working world that we're in. Uh, and a key of our product is it's very flexible and configurable. So uh, a lot of the products out there require a business to work the way that they've decided is the way to work and, and that their system uh, enforces as a process. With IntelliHR, we can actually help you configure the product to the way that you want to work. A number of our customers have distinct cultures uh, that they want to support through the way that they manage and engage and uh, understand the performance of their people. And so our product is incredibly configurable, allowing them to work the way they want to. Um, it's built to be a global platform. We have uh, a number of uh, customers in over 20 countries uh, and we have a number of languages on the platform and that keeps growing as we get uh, customer need and demand. If you could go to the next slide, please. So while us and most of uh, the, the competitors in the, this sector um, are, are well off their 52-week highs, the underlying drivers that have been powering this, um, this growth in HR tech continue. Uh, key among those, obviously, is digital transformation. HR is one of the last groups to really um, come to the digital transformation uh, uh, time. Uh, I spent eight years at Microsoft in Redmond headquarters before coming back to Australia. And I was responsible for the Office 365 business. And what we saw is that digital transformation started first in finance and sales and marketing and all of these other frontline groups, but HR was, was left uh, a little bit behind. Um, but that's really hitting the HR market right now. Certainly hybrid working is the new normal. Uh, we've come out of, uh, we're in a post COVID era. A lot of businesses are trying to work out what to do. Do they maintain these uh, large real estate leases? Do they embrace people working from home? What's right for their business? And businesses are coming up with their own combination um, that makes best sense for them. And we can help empower any of those businesses because our product allows you to stay connected and understanding both the productivity and the well-being of every employee in the business. We've also seen the rise of the CPO, and it's something I saw in technology back in the 90s with Y2K, where we went from an IT leader to the creation of the CIO role. We've seen the same with COVID and the creation of the chief people officer, now responsible for people and culture uh, in the business. Um, this is Kathleen Hogan, who I worked with at Microsoft, and it's certainly a role that is starting to, and will spend the next 10 years, carving out what its areas of responsibility and functional uh, responsibility and accountability for businesses will be. And I think we'll see some evolution there. And that's great for our business because we've built a platform that can continue to innovate and keep pace with those leading uh, HR uh, people and what they need out of a platform like ours. And certainly we're also seeing businesses try and work out how to build a performance culture when they can't have all their employees in one building, when they can't see them regularly, um, they're managing them across remote and, and, and hybrid styles. Uh, and so there's a new algorithm um, of, of the workplace and it's built around being employee centric having an, a clear understanding of aligned goals between the business and the individuals of the business having agility and being able to move and change with the, with change, the market, um, with their own um, uh, business conditions. Uh, engagement is 
primary and, uh, and giving managers who've learned how to manage people in a room the, the tools and the skill sets to be able to manage people who they may only see once a month um, is very different today. Um, well-being and performance being the ultimate outcome uh, for the business. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, last year was a good year for our business. Uh, we had a 97% growth in our, our ARR, um, a number of uh, fantastic uh, brands and businesses that have chosen IntelliHR. Uh, in our last quarterly report, we noted uh, there were at 8.37 million ARR at this point. Uh, our key focus for this uh, fiscal year is, is both getting to 10 million and beyond 10 million ARR and to start to reach um, a, a, an operating cash flow break even state. Uh, we have more than 330 customers in 20 countries, uh, more than 78,000 uh, headcount on the platform now, uh, and a large percentage of that is offshore. Um, we do have a number of customers in North America and the UK and continue to grow both of those businesses as well as here in the home market. And you can see from these brands with Mitre 10, uh, with uh, SwiftX, who are in, in the cryptocurrency, largest cryptocurrency exchange in Australia, uh, Baby Bunting, uh, an amazing law firm, Lander and Rogers, uh, OSL, a, a huge retail services business, 8,000 headcount over in uh, North America. Scope, of course, um, here in Australia, Discovery Parks. Showcase is interesting because when we win things overseas, um, local investors don't always know how to understand those. Showcase is twice the size of Hoyts. So it's, it's, a, it's a big cinema chain group. Um, obviously, Dakin in the industrial area and the fastest growing healthcare brand in Australia, MyHealth. So you can see we're across a number of categories now. So it's been great to pressure test and, and innovate the platform uh, together with HR leaders across a whole range of different um, business conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's, it's also been pleasing to receive some global customer and thought leader recognition recently. Uh, Jason Averbrook on the left there is one of the two leading um, HR tech thought leaders in the space. Um, Josh Burson being the other one. Uh, and, and Jason, uh, we've taken through the product at depth and certainly he really appreciates um, the core um, uh, intelligence piece to our product of the analytic capabilities, um, great visualization of data and being able now through work we've been doing in the UK with a partner, uh, a payroll partner there called Sintra, we can now actually sit in front of payroll and we can push data to payroll and be the first point of contact and the onboarding mechanism for both payroll and HR, um, which is pretty unique. And then G2, which is a very large independent um, uh, review site in the US, about 5 million B2B shoppers uh, a month come to their site and leave reviews. Um, and so our customers have been leaving reviews, our competitors' customers have been leaving reviews, and we're really um, pleased to see the hard work we've done to, to please our customers uh, to be non, um, uh, recognized as a global momentum leader for the first time, um, which is really big for us. And you can see a number of other uh, great awards there. I think our analytics was uh, the, the global easiest to use from an analytics perspective and a number of Asia Pacific Australia recognitions as well. Next slide, please. Uh, how we position, the way that people think about us um, is represented here from, from very basic capability systems to more enterprise capability uh, and from quite expensive to more affordable. Uh, when, when customers see us, they see something that they can uh, achieve enterprise capability, but at a mid-market price. Uh, and certainly from a capability perspective, we're incredibly customizable. Um, we integrate with uh, all number of systems to make it really simple when you bring us into your business. It doesn't mean ripping out a lot of other tech that you're wedded to. Um, we have very advanced analytics um, up against an, a number of the, the global leaders and certainly speed to value. We can get a customer up and running really quickly. Um, uh, Mitre 10 is a great example. Uh, our competitors were, were quoting nine to 12 months. We got them up and running in, in less than six. Um, if you go to the next slide, it, it's pretty unusual for a business of our micro size to be winning against some of the world's biggest most well-financed players, but we have been uh, in the last six months alone. Um, we've won customers uh, up against each of these uh, people here, um, and our customers have told us uh, that these reasons around the single source of truth, the enterprise capability, um, the implementation speed, that we're truly a cloud-first solution um, with really easy data flows um, across the system uh, and, and really good deep uh, insights. Uh, on the next slide, a great example of that um, is 
you know, we're, we're looking to create this next generation of proactive people leaders. So with a lot of the competitive products, um, if the CEO wants to know what's going on with attrition, the uh, HR leader is able to tell them the attrition number because they're basically a reporting system. Our system, however, is an intelligent system. So the, the same customer using IntelliHR can tell them the attrition number, can tell them the four or five key drivers that are creating that attrition, can show what parts of the business that attrition is likely to happen next, right down to the individual um, employee level of people that managers might want to reach out to and connect to, to ensure that attrition doesn't happen when they don't want it to. Um, so a really deep intelligence-based a machine learning algorithm based um, set of insights that uh, our, our customers really love um, that they get to have. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, just to finish on, on where we were at at the end of Q1, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 8.37 uh, ARR, um, up over 78,000 uh, headcount on platform. Um, and uh, one analyst a few weeks ago was calling us a baby Elmo because Elmo has obviously been in the news. Uh, and I think that's down to a couple of things. If you look at the average customer ARR of about 25,000, uh, almost somewhere around 27,000. So they're quite similar there. While they're 10 times our size from a revenue perspective, uh, we do have excellent um, uh, churn uh, of less than 1%. Uh, I think their business is up over 10% uh, in, in that regard. So um, a really interesting business, um, really excited to be uh, uh, able to share it with you today. and and open for questions. Thanks, Matt. Uh, just on Elmo, we've seen a number of uh, Australian technology platforms kind of subject to takeover bids, which is probably quite rare. What, what, what do you think is kind of attracting the offshore player to look at technology platforms like yours, for example? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I can tell you when I was sitting in headquarters at, at Microsoft that we were looking at Australian tech all the time. Um, and, and I think that that's because Australians have a really good way of, of identifying a, a real insight and need that people have and, and a really good way of addressing that in uh, a simple way um, from the beginning that can scale. And so I think that attracts a lot of overseas investment and people are waiting to see when those businesses reach the right level of scale, they're, they're looking to, to swoop in and, and find ways that they can, can acquire those assets. So it's not surprising to me. I know that when we were there, we looked at a number of uh, now uh, very well-known uh, unicorns here in Australia, and we looked at whether we should acquire them or not. And uh, so I think Australia is a, definitely a, a technology um, hidden, hidden gem, as today is called. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for the plug. Um, so is the, is the platform disrupting something in the market or, or is it the emergence of, you know, work from home and this performance culture and, and the ability to measure performance? Is that where the, the focus really is? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think what, what we used to look at was um, with Office was the first generation of Office was digitising human behaviour. And that lasted for about 20 years. The next phase of Office was, well, once everything's digitised, what do you do with it? And I think IntelliHR has looked beyond where a lot of our competitors are today, where they've been acquiring uh, different capabilities in the area of digitizing the HR workflow. Um, and they're, they're based in an area of reporting, um, of reporting numbers, uh, which is good. And, and that helps um, HR, obviously. I think where we've gone is the next step. We're already in phase two, which is, well, once it's digitized, what do you do with the data? And so every different uh, app or business that we're able to integrate with um, feeds uh, data into the platform and makes the platform smarter. It allows us to give the HR person deeper insights based on the range of different data inputs that we have, as well as allowing them to do the basics of HR, onboarding people, engaging people, running performance um, um, management, and so on. So those, those core functionalities are still covered in the product, but we have this uh, extra layer that I think is, is pretty interesting to, to customers. And, and Matt, are we talking about a, a SaaS sort of subscription product model here? Um, what's kind of the average subscription? You, you may have touched on that, sorry. And and uh, let, let's go from there. And then the pathway perhaps to kind of cash flow positive. There's a question in that regard. Yeah, definitely. I think um, on, on the first piece, uh, we, we have a tiered product. It's definitely a SaaS product. Um, we have monthly um, subscription or annual um, subscription uh, that the customers can pay. We implement the product and configure it to you. Uh, so there's the ability to both configure for a business that is 
trying to utilize bringing in a piece of technology to help them change their culture will instead help them through design workshops understand what they want their uh, HR and and people management approach to be and then configure the product to that uh, so there's that implementation piece as well um, where, where we also uh, earn revenue um, from a, a pathway to um, uh, operating cash flow break even I think there's a few things when I entered the business about uh, two quarters ago um, the business was uh, driving uh, demand through paid digital marketing uh, and, and that's a pretty time-honored tradition for, for small SaaS businesses to spend their way into the marketplace. Um, what we've done since then uh, uh, is to open up our ability to do uh, organic marketing. Um, our, we've rebuilt our website from the ground up to be far more search engine attractive. That goes live um, this weekend. Uh, and then opened up a partner channel. We've started to build partner relationships at the reseller uh, and at the uh, consulting level um, who are looking to build um, potential uh, their own services around our product. Uh, and so there's a, there's a partner drive for us at the moment. Uh, and then we have a number of innovative, um, uh, I guess, experiments. Um, one of the key ones that our investors who've been with the business for a while would know uh, is with a big payroll provider in the UK called Sintra. And we've created a product together called Sintra HR, uh, powered by IntelliHR. And that's a, a joint payroll HR product um, that we're marketing in, in the UK market right now. And I think that's pretty exciting. That's taught us a lot about payroll. It's taught us how to sit in front of payroll. And I'm certainly talking to a number of payroll providers now to see if we can uh, create interesting products to take to market together as well. Yeah, it's really interesting that we've had pay group on in the past who are pay, payroll group and a platformer who got taken over. So a good way to finish the conversation. But thank you for your time. Have a nice weekend and uh, we'll get you back on uh, next year. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ram. Thanks, Matt. Uh, next up, we have Melbana Energy, uh, market cap around 145 million, ASX code MAY. We've got Andrew Purcell, who's the executive chairman. The company is an independent oil and gas company that has a focused portfolio of high impact exploration, appraisal and development stage opportunities in Cuba. And I'll let you pronounce that uh, region in Australia. Thanks, Matt. Um, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much, Tim. Good to be here with you all today. Yeah, we've been uh, on the ASX boards for over 20 years. We're uh, unashamedly an oil and gas explorer, but we have a very uh, a very exciting transition in front of us right at the moment. And if I could jump ahead a couple of slides, please. What we have on the plates at the moment is a great team. And that team is what has been responsible for bringing us to where we are today. Now at this point in the world where we're gonna transition from being an explorer to being a producer, we hope next year and at a time when energy prices around the world are very favourable and, in my opinion, unlikely to get any better for in, in the near future. So we've got a good uh, combination of skills from operational to finance to oil and gas, all with tier one oil companies, investment banks around the world. And we've got plenty of cash in the tin. And that's the other good side of it. Yeah, everything that we now need to do, we've got good partners, we've got good cash, but we don't need anything from the market here to deliver on the promise that we have been putting forward for the last couple of years. Ahead, please. What we have at the moment, the two principal project lines uh, to look at for next year. Uh, what we're doing firstly in Cuba, which is a, a jurisdiction that's unfamiliar to many people in this part of the world, is that it's important to recognise that Cuba is part of the Gulf of Mexico, one of the world's great hydrocarbon zones. And we have been in there for five years. We've got a very large block. We have just completed drilling our first two exploration wells in the just last month. And what we have found this year, as I'll talk to in a moment, has been substantial discoveries onshore of oil but we'll move into appraising that very shortly but in addition coming up next year we have a very in, very large interest in a very exciting well being drilled offshore australia uh, that if that comes in it is going to be also very remunerative for our shareholders forward please the first well that we drilled earlier this year that ended up finding three independent reservoirs of movable oil in the one well. 
stacked vertically. The combined column of oil that we found was uh, net almost 300 metres of oil. Uh, these sort of extents of discovery on shore are rare. And if I take you through to the next page, it'll probably start to put it in perspective of what those numbers mean. We took that discovery, we gave it to independent experts who have been operating in Cuba for a long time for other companies, a Canadian group. And what they have established for us is an estimate of a 6 billion barrel oil in place estimate of which they think we're gonna be able to recover about 267 million barrels, best estimate. That is makes it one of the world's great oil discoveries onshore particularly um, in the last decade. We have that under our belt. We're the operator. We are running this drilling program. Our partner is the National Oil Company of Angola, Africa's second largest oil producer. So they've been paying 85% of the bills for this exploration program. We paid 15%. And as operator, we were able to control costs and keep the pace of the program running. And next slide. And if I look at what we're about to do, we're preparing now to start the appraisal program. Having explored and found so much oil, what we now do is appraise it to determine the flow qualities, the reservoir characteristics, the quality of the oil. And we have two wells permitted and approved and funded to take place starting in Q1 of next year. Uh, those two wells will, if the appraisal program is successful, uh, be put onto immediate production. We're already geared up with tanks and trucking to allow that oil to go to market. So we're not talking a multi-year, how do I take a good discovery with good production characteristics into commerciality? This is all ready to go. And we're on an island. So it's not like Australia, we have to build a 500 kilometre pipeline to take a discovery to market sometimes. We're 50 kilometres from a deep water oil terminal, uh, an oil battery, and a lot of oil field infrastructure because Cuba produces about 50,000 barrels a day of oil around us. Uh, so there's a lot of existing infrastructure in the country already. So these two wells will take place um, starting early next year. And this is being the end of a long road uh, for our shareholders. And when we made that discovery last year, early last year in that first well, our share price was four times what it is now. And with the headwinds of the world and, and the delays of getting back to appraising it, and the, you know, the inflation scares in the market, our share price, like oil, all junior explorers has, has taken a battering. But I would take the opportunity to remind people listening, this is a hotly demanded commodity in the world today. There aren't endless new supplies of it coming on stream because it's very, very difficult to fight the ESG headwinds around the world in developed countries particularly in getting new supply online and getting it online quickly. So to have a major discovery under your belt on an island close to infrastructure with the company and its partners well funded for an appraisal program that can bring oil on very soon makes this an incredibly exciting opportunity, which we've already seen the potential of given our share price over the, over the last six months. Next slide, please. In addition, our job has been to find and advance good exploration opportunities that we have then gone and found international partners to help us fund the drilling of. We've been very good at this so far. And then one such opportunity that's coming into focus next year is a, a large carbonate buildup offshore northern Australia, shallow water, quite close to Darwin. Uh, these carbonate buildups are a new play type for Australia, but when they've been tried elsewhere in the world and when they've worked, they tend to work very big. And that's why this is such an exciting play. We were successful in getting a Houston-based oil company, a $60 billion Fortune 500 oil company, interested enough in this project to buy it off us. 
last, late last year. So they're making a country entry into Australia to drill this one well because they know, like we know, when these things work, they work big. And the independent assessment here is that this could have up to 1.4 billion barrels of, of oil or equivalent right on Australia's northern shore doorstep. A good jurisdiction, good fiscal terms, very sizable prize for a company of that size. They paid us seven and a half million US cash up front to take the license. We have an ongoing interest in their, in their success. They'll pay us more cash, another five million subject to certain terms. But the real prize for us is that they are successful and start producing from this field. They will pay us 10 million US dollars for every 25 million barrels produced. And as I said, it could be up to 1.4 billion barrels, we think. And we don't have to pay another cent. We just sit back now, let this big oil company do what it's going to do. And if it comes in, we just sit there and we'll gratefully receive the checks. So this, with Cuba happening next year, for a company of our size and our cash position, uh, we have de-risked the portfolio to an extent at a time of great demand for energy. Uh, it's a very exciting runway ahead. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your time. I probably got through that nice and quickly to leave a few times for questions, uh, Tim. You did. Thank you, Andrew. Um, you've, you've got a big retail following from what I can remember. Have you attracted any institutional attention? Yep, we got some instos on the register when we did a raising back in March of this year, but at a, it's less than 5% of our register at the moment. Yeah, it looks like the, you know, the, as you said, there's an incredible footprint and story here. I'm surprised it hasn't attracted institutional support. Um, that said, you've got some operating partners. Can you talk a little bit about what, what the deal is with your your, oper your, your funding partner in, in Cuba moving forward? You mentioned uh, 6 billion barrels. I think that's correct. Uh, moving forward, how does that work in terms of profitability and profit share? Well, the agreement we have with them is that we're 30% of the license, they're 70% of the license. For the first two wells, there was a different deal. But going forward, we are on what's called a heads up basis. We pay 30% of the bills, so they pay 70% of the bills. And that's the same percentage split on the production and the, pro and, and the benefits that will accrue from producing oil. And, and can you talk, talk us through kind of your, your, your timeline to production? How long is this going to take? We could, uh, we, you know, we're, here we are in late November. I've got my team working hard. We've just released the rig from the end of the exploration program. It's going through uh, maintenance and recertification, and blowout preventers and, and key components, safety testing, it's doing a bit of civil works. Short answer is I hope to have the rig back and spinning in February of uh, the new year. And the first well is very shallow. It's only 1,800 metres and we, we just drilled it. So we know what we're drilling into. It'll be quick, uh, like, you know, a month quick. And when the oil starts flowing there, we'll, we'll let it flow. And the Cubans are very keen to have oil. So if the appraisal is successful, if the flow rate is good, and, and for those who haven't been following our story, when we drilled that well last year, that flow came at us under pressure. It was very exciting. So let's see how it performs. Let's start putting it out into tanks and start exporting it. And, and you spoke about uh, the infrastructure, the existing infrastructure there and an existing industry, oil industry in Cuba. What's the kind of political environment like for uh, an outsider, so to speak? Well, Cuba's implemented uh, foreign investment laws back in 2014 that have encouraged foreign investment. And that's been a very, a very good place to operate. My background, I, I had a long time with Credit Suisse uh, doing emerging market resource projects all over the world. Uh, so I have, I have had some you know, uh, skinned elbows in my time in some jurisdictions around the world. And this one doesn't give me the heebie-jeebies at all. They're a very, very professional, well-educated, competent regulator and political environment. They're very keen for the foreign investment. They, they have a lot of headwinds for their economy because of the amount of money they make from tourism and the COVID stopped the tourists coming. They're needing to import oil to make up the deficiency in their own production. 
And because of the historical relationship with the US and the uh, you know, people who do come in and who do operate there are, are treated with golden gloves. So uh, I, I find the jurisdiction very effective and very ably to be worked in. And, and the strategy here is, <coughs> excuse me, is for your Australian assets to kind of produce cash flow to help you in Cuba. Is that how it works? And and if you, yeah, no, no, fair comment. But no, I don't need one to subsidise the other. They're both, you know, Australia is an exploration opportunity that we don't have to write another check for. The, the Americans are writing that check, and if they're successful, we'll sit there and take you know, the payments they, they are going to give to us. So that's tremendous. Uh, Cuba is, we have our funding already sufficient for Cuba to do these appraisal wells. And if they're going to be successful, these appraisal wells, which are very, a very good confidence in the performance we've seen in the oil already, that they, they will be, uh, then that will be a, re a revenue stream for Cuba. And we'll keep the two things separate and run two different businesses, Australia and Cuba. And I mean, ultimately, if you get to this very successful stage, you're going to attract the attention of big oil at some point, aren't you? At this size of the discovery, exactly right. You know, well, well, we've got, as I said, a major national oil company as our partner already. Um, as, you know, the six billion barrel find that we've made. How much of that is economically recoverable? The independent experts said maybe four four hundred million barrels of that. I'd be delighted at four hundred million barrels, and so would our partner. That's a global, globally significant resource to a, to have found onshore. But and, there's good reasons there could be more. And and so that equation, when do you find out or when do you get to a stage where you can work those numbers harder and be more accurate on the scale of 400 million to 6 billion? You're going to know starting first quarter next year. Um, and maybe by, the, maybe by the second quarter, we've then given you even more confidence because we've run the flow tests for a period of time. And as you watch, declines in how the oil produces from the reservoir and you then shut it in and let the pressure build back up and then watch what the profile is again. You can take that last piece of data and marry it with all of the volumetrics that the independent experts have done to say, you know what, the 400 million barrel looks like being plus or minus X. And that's when you have confidence in, in the number. Andrew, thanks for your time. Good luck out there. Good luck first quarter next year. We'll follow with interest. Thanks for your time, Tim. Thank you. Um, if you're looking for IOU, we're going to have them present um, in fourth part. Now, um, next up, we have Encounter Resources, ASX code ENR, uh, market cap around $74 million. We have with us Will Robinson, who is the Managing Director. Encounter Resources engages in the exploration and development of mineral deposits in Australia. The company explores for zinc, copper, gold, and cobalt. Will? Thanks for your time. Over to you. Thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks to all the uh, viewers who are tuning in this morning, particularly the uh, Encounter Resources shareholders. Um, Encounter is focused on uh, discovering copper, gold, and rare earths um, uh, in, in Central Australia. There's a huge opportunity that's emerging uh, in Australia at the moment um, for a whole lot of uh, commodities that are in very hot demand uh, globally. Can you go forward two slides, please? That's just a snapshot of, uh, of Encounter. Um, we're one of the largest exploration landholders in Australia. Uh, we've targeted on three major regions uh, in the Northern Territory, in the West Arantia in Western Australia, and the Patterson Province also in, in Western Australia. Uh, we're well funded to complete our uh, exploration plans on our 100% owned projects. Um, we've got some terrific partners with uh, BHP, South32 and IGO uh, partnering on projects and providing uh, funding support to those projects. Uh, the board itself, uh, we've got Paul Chapman. He was uh, very successful as the founding chairman of Silver Lake Resources. Uh, took that to a billion dollar company. Uh, Philip Crutchfield uh, was the founding chairman of, uh, of Zipco and he took that to a billion dollar company. Uh, we also got two of the leading geological minds of the generation, Dr. John Ronsky and Peter Buick on our board. And Dr. John was uh, awarded in the North of Australia for his services to, to geology in Australia. And they really have helped design and build what is uh, 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 one of the largest exploration portfolios uh, for, for copper um, and rare earths uh, in Australia. 
Uh, we've got a uh, register that's um, uh, about 20% institutional. We've also got um, IGO and Silver Lake resources on our uh, register to corporates um, and the board and management still holds around 14% of the stock, giving us skin in the game and alignment with our, um, uh, with our shareholders. You just move forward. So this is a summary of the uh, project portfolio, um, really split into um, two main categories. About half the portfolio is funded in partnerships with some of the leading resource companies in the world, BHP, South City 2 and IGO. Um, and that's uh, uh, projects that are, uh, BHP and IGO have just finished drilling um, and South 32 is planning to start drilling in, uh, in 2023. Uh, we've got a large portfolio of 100% owned projects and I'm going to spend most of the limited time today talking about the West Arunta because this is a new mineral province that's emerging in Australia and it could have national significance. Next slide, please. Um, it's, it really is a fabulous time to be in mineral exploration uh, in Australia and particularly for the commodities that we're, um, we're, we're looking for. Um, copper, no matter what sort of scenario uh, you look at, is desperately uh, undersupplied in the next 20 years when there's much copper to be found uh, in the next 20 years as we've used since the dawn of mankind. So look, copper, rare earth, lithium, all those commodities that are going into the electrification uh, that's happening around the world um, and, Australia, and the encounters right at the forefront of that working with some of the uh, leading uh, companies in this space, trying to find new sources of, uh, of, of these commodities in Central Australia. Uh, next slide, please. That's just a summary of what's been happening recently. Um, there's been drilling happening in the Patterson province on our 100% owned Lamel project. Uh, IGO has been drilling at our Yanina project, uh, also in the Patterson province. I won't, uh, I won't talk about them today. Uh, we've got work commencing uh, on our lithium projects in the Northern Territory. We just completed a gravity survey at our Sandover Copper project uh, in the Northern Territory. Uh, BHP's just finished uh, a drill program uh, and they'll be reporting results um, in, uh, early in the new year. Um, but today I'll, I'll talk mostly about the um, what's emerging in the Western Arunta region of, of, of Western Australia, where it's very early stage, it's a very, it's a, it's a new district. Um, uh, where uh, our cells and, and, and WA1 have been finding new rare earths um, and niobium under thin cover in, in what looks like a new province for, uh, for Australia for, for minerals. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is what I guess we say it's a, it's a focus for copper and rare earths uh, uh, in Western Australia. I think that's going to be of global significance if things keep going in the direction they're going. Uh, next slide, please. That's our, our land position now. One of the things that when we are targeting new areas and we are at the forefront of, of uh, a lot of the frontier areas for mineral exploration in Australia is that we uh, like to have large land positions uh, established early on. Uh, we moved into this area in 2018 um, and secured our first ground, which we subsequently expanded. We have a plus 100 kilometre long belt uh, of the West Arunta. Um, and three new rare earth occurrences have been identified in this uh, very poor, uh, um, underexplored area um, uh, over the last uh, over the last two years. We were the, we put the first hole into our Worsley prospect, um, which we reported results uh, early last year. Um, and obviously, topically in, in the last few uh, in the last few weeks, WA1, our neighbours, has identified two niobium rare earth carbonotype discoveries in the district. We think this is showing all the hallmarks of uh, uh, the early hallmarks of what could be a new mineral province for Australia. We think it has enormous potential for rare earth carbonotites and IOCG deposits uh, under thin cover. Next slide, please. Now this is the very first hole uh, drilled into this um, into this project, um, and we uh, um, uh, we completed this hole, um, and uh, it had. Exactly what you want to see in a uh, in a new uh, new uh, region. If it was the first hole, uh, aside from banging into an ore body, um, we had elevated copper, uh, moly, gold, niobium, and rare earth elements. Exactly the signature that we we're looking for when we we're looking for an IOCG top deposit. Uh, one of the things we didn't know drilling the first hole into a new belt was how deep the cover could be. Um, it was only five meters. And this has really serious implications from an exploration perspective in that we can apply surface geochemical techniques um, and obviously anything that we potentially find under this thin cover um, is going to be more developable. One of the really interesting things was it, this looked um, for all intents and purposes like the sort of drill hole you drill on the margin of one of, an IOC, one of those IOCG deposits in South Australia. Uh, we subsequently got 
uh, the granites and uh, aged, uh, age dated or um, by the uh, Geological Survey of Western Australia. And this is um, rewritten the geological map out here. It's come back at the same, a similar age to the Olympic Dam, uh, hilt of a sweet granite um, with a metamorphic event shortly thereafter. So it is really uh, the same age, um, um, a similar event. Um, it's occurring here under thin cover in Western Australia, not under five or you know five, 500 metres of cover like it is in South Australia. We're seeing this geology under five metres of cover, and and um, uh, and that's really really important. Next slide, please. So it's just that once we'd finished that first hole and we'd seen how significant the, that hole was. Now, importantly, the rig broke down on that drill hole. We only drilled 158 metres. The target was at about 300 metres. And that magnetic anomaly that we were targeting. What we didn't have before that uh, uh, drill hole was a, was a gravity survey. So we did a gravity survey um, uh, last year um, and we com uh, completed that uh, box in the middle of the, uh, the slide you can see. Um, that's been a really fundamental data set. It's, it's enabled us to really have an idea on the, on the important structures that are running through this project and it's identified a number of really important targets. Um, including the CARE target right along strike from the um, uh, learning discovery from uh, WA1, which was announced this week. Um, and these structures are really important for providing the deep plumbing uh, required for uh, rare earth carbonatites and ISDG deposits. So um, that's one of the form, uh, fundamental data sets that we've collected so far. When we had the chopper in the area, um, to, we did this with a with a chopper. Um, we had the the, uh, uh, the guys copped in for a couple of uh, for half a day, and um, they landed on the Shackleton anomaly and, and chipped half percent rare earths off the deck. So, look, this is either a very very um, we've obviously been uh, ourselves in WI one very very fortunate in our first drilling out here, drilling uh, rare earths niobium in all three drill holes um, and being able to um, sample rare earths off the deck. Or this is a really really um, uh, promising area for for new discoveries. Um, you know, that's over over 30 or 40 kilometres. Um, there's three sample points, and they've all got um, they've all got rare earth um, and uh, and niobium and the sort of signature you might find in around one of those IOCG deposits, as well as one of the um, uh, mineralised carbonatite. Next slide, please. So this is just moving from gravity to, to magnetics. There's a number of fundamental data sets we need to put in place to help us help guide our exploration. Uh, the Worsley targets, you can see how that, how much that stands out, and that's why we we uh, we wanted to drill that first drill hole. We will complete that drill hole in 2023. Um, we'll test a number of other targets, including Creed and Caird and Shackleton. Um, we've uh, kicked off a um, uh, an 8,000 line kilometre magnetic survey, um, which is a fundamental data set to help us refine those that, those targets. And we just recently received a $220,000 grant from the Western Australian government. Uh, this is uh, from the Exploration Incentive Scheme, which is designed to open up new belts like uh, we think we've got onto out here at, uh, at the West Toronto. Next slide, please. That's just showing you the belt um, belt scale image again, just showing where we're doing this 100 metre line space this, uh, uh, magnetic survey. Uh, we really uh, have been working on this um, on, our, on our core project around Worsley. Um, we're expanding that to the east um, through this survey and we'll do gravity and uh, soil geochemistry early in the new year. Um, as the uh, activity in this belt really starts to, to um, heat up. So that's what we think is going to be a, a, a mineral province you're going to hear a lot more about in the next few years in Australia. Um, it's, it's very remote, it's very untouched, but the, the three holes that have been, or the three areas that have been drilled so far have all been mineralised. Um, and we think it's very unlikely that um, that's not the start of something more significant. Next slide, please. So while um, we've been obviously very busy in Western Australia, um, we're also um, one of the largest exploration landholders in the Northern Territory. Next slide. So we control almost 30,000 square kilometres uh, in the Northern Territory. Uh, we were very aggressive to secure new ground um, based off uh, new, government, new government data sets provided by the Geological um, uh, G uh, GA. Um, and they've been providing a lot of um, new data in these parts of the world because you had major mines at, at Mount Isa and Century and Tennant Creek, and in between you had very little exploration that had been done, and that's because it was covered. So a lot of the outcropping deposits in Australia have been found. What we really are, as an industry, looking now is to come getting under thin cover and finding that same geology and finding this, the, uh, the next generation of deposits that's going to be required. So we moved in aggressively. We pegged and secured a number of the best uh, copper anomalies in this data set, also some of the best ge um, geophysical um, addresses. 
Uh, we attracted BHP as a partner into our Elliott project, and Jessica uh, and Jessica and Carrara were in two separate partnerships with South32. So we've got a third of a project being controlled by uh, a run by a BHP, a third by South32, and a third is 100% is owned ours. And pretty much everyone who's in the copper space is in the Northern Territory looking for copper at the moment. Next slide, please. I'll just talk about one slide, which is our, I guess our Sandover Copper and, Lith and Lithium uh, uh, Junction Lithium project. Um, uh, Sandover Copper is where we've, we've mapped a 20 kilometre long outcropping copper horizon. Uh, we've got drilling planned there in 2023. Um, and the Junction Lithium project, where this is one of the two provinces in, in um, Northern Territory that was identified by the Northern Territory Geological Survey as being having these, uh, these pegmatite provinces that are prospective for these uh, lithium pegmatites. Uh, Pine Creek is where uh, Core Lithium is developing their um, uh, their Finnis project. Uh, the second one is the North Aranta Pigmatite Province, and we're one of the largest landholders in this district. Um, we've got a very interesting um, uh, structural position um, and target that we've identified at uh, a junction, and um, we're just kicking off exploration there at the moment. Next slide, please. So that's just to sum up. Um, we are a bit different from a lot of exploration companies uh, in that we've got such a large um, half of our portfolio has been funded by major mining companies, and we think that's a, a good way to go about this sort of um, uh, exploration that enables you to work through the cycles, enable the big companies to provide the sort of balance sheet, technical input, and, and resources to enable you to go after the sort of things that can turn the dial for them. And if they turn the, you know, it, the sort of things they're looking for um, have to be meaningful for a BHP or a South 32 or an IGO. And if they are successful, they're going to be um, very good results for our shareholders. And we're going to continue to work up our 100% owned projects in the Northern Territory and Western Australia. Um, and obviously a particular focus in the next 12 months at uh, and what's happening in the Aileron province um, in Western Australia. Next slide, please. So lots coming up. Um, uh, we've got this magnetic survey, which we expect to come back now next week or the week after. Uh, we've got work going on uh, that to commence at that junction. We've had drilling happening from both BHP, ourselves and um, an IGO over recent months, and those results will be reported um, uh, around Christmas and into the new year. Um, and we're gearing up to be um, on the ground early in the new year and commencing drilling in the uh, uh, in the April to June period at uh, at Aileron. Um, and our partners will be kicking off their exploration around the same time. So, look, it's a really interesting time coming up for Encounter, um, and you know, we think that uh, we're at the forefront of a renaissance of of new uh, exploration opportunities in Australia. Um, and I don't think it's going to go away. So, that's enough for me from this morning. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Will. Uh, looks like you're going to be busy next year. You're, you're kind of uh, spoilt for choice across a massive land holding. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right, Tim. We've just um, <laughs> we've we've uh, we take a view that you, you're better off to have the land and then fit, and then you find the funding place funding to uh, to advance it as quickly as possible. Um, if that means bringing on a partner, we do that. If we think we can do it ourselves, we'll do it ourselves. Um, but yeah, it is a bit of a it's a it's a uh, it's it's a big story because it's we're we're you know in some in some respects we're about six companies in one. Yeah, it looks like that. So with a with a farm in, and you touched on that and didn't have time to spend much time on that. But BHP farm in, how how does that work? Yeah, well, um, we we've got a uh, obviously our technical team is very attuned at being able to identify new opportunities. Um, we've leveraged off new uh, government data sets, and we and we then do the early stage work to to bring these opportunities um, to to the, to the companies, or we get approached in, in, in um, um, uh, on that on it by the, by the companies. We then uh, let them fund activities. We design the, the the deal such that we don't want to be contributing to exploration with a, with a major mining company. So we make the earnings such that they're spending enough money so that if we're being asked to contribute, they've found something. So in the case of the BHP deal, they have to spend $25 million. And if they spend $25 million, I think the likelihood is that they have found and they're onto something. Um, the South 32 deals, there's two deals there. They're both carried through to a, to a scoping study. So they have to provide us with a scoping study, which will require a, um, a mineral resource um, and then we'll make a decision as to whether we want to fund or or go, or go to a royalty. So that's the sort of structures we have. We have we don't we want to make it easy for, for for partners to come in to spend their money as quickly as they as they can. Um, and then if we get to a you know, if we have success, then we really do want to partner into production with, with one of these major mining companies. And and just finally, and they are significant names in regards to your partnerships. Now, rare earths. We've seen a lot of gold companies focus on rare earths, but from a funding perspective, 
it's a it's a way off compared to the sort of assets and partners you were talking about then. And and ironically, rare earths actually aren't that rare. So what's the sort of pathing uh, funding pathway look like? Um, it seems to be an area where the macro tailwinds are there, but the funding doesn't get spoken about a lot. Yeah, well, I think that's, I mean, rare earths has probably changed a bit in the last five years and just the fundamentals of of the government support that you're seeing going into um, into the rare earth uh, developments, both in America and in Australia. Um, and I think that's another source of funding that wasn't available five or 10 years ago. I think these are, you know, rare earths are of national significance. They're fundamental to so many technologies required. Um, they're on the critical minerals list for, 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 for most of the European countries, the US and Australia. Um, so I think um, what we're seeing now is that the market is starting to um, wake up to the to the opportunities that are emerging in, in, in rare earths. As you say, they're not geologically all that rare, but finding one that makes money um, is, a, is, 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 um, uh, is much more difficult. And, uh, you know, one of the things out of that is, you know, these IACG deposits um, in South Australia, you know, Olympic Dam, there's a lot of rare earths in, in, in these IACGs. And I think going forward, you're going to see that um, you know, a copper um, you know, a copper bo- uh, uh, development with a with a rare earth byproduct is a very good opportunity. Well, that's all we have time for. Really appreciate your time. Fascinating story. Congratulations on those partnerships. Thanks, Tim. Now we're going to welcome back uh, IOU Pay. We've got Paul Russell back with us, I believe. We'll start back at the beginning. Paul, are you with us? Doesn't appear so at yep. the moment. Here he is. Hi, Paul, Tim. thanks for your time. We'll start at scratch and uh, go from there. Thank you. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for having me today, Tim. Um, the presentation today is largely an extract from our business strategy update, which we announced on the 21st of July this year. Um, so if we just start on slide number three. Um, IE Pay is a fintech business listed in Australia, but based in Malaysia operating for nearly 20 years, providing secure digital payment processing for banks, telcos, and major corporates in Malaysia and Indonesia. The company is focused on large communities of low risk consumers and merchants, which has led us to establish a highly scalable market leading BNPL platform servicing Malaysia and seeking to expand into the Southeast Asian region. Our goal is to be one of the leading digital transaction processes in the large and growing cashless economies of Southeast Asia. Next slide. Over its 20 year history, the company has established a number of core capabilities that set the foundation for successful growth. We have developed a trusted and secure technology platform, a highly targeted customer acquisition plan and specific digital marketing strategies. We have a sophisticated credit and risk management system and an experienced senior management team with expertise in wholesale debt funding, corporate finance and m and This has led us to a number of highlights and achievements over the past 12 months. Next slide. IU's base business continues to perform strongly, reflecting the fundamental shift in consumer behaviours towards digital transactions. There are now over 350 million digital consumers in Southeast Asia and this number continues to grow. However, credit is difficult to obtain, which is providing opportunities for BNPL and other consumer finance products. As a result, the company has launched its My IOU BNPL service in June 2021 and made a strategic investment in IDSB, one of Malaysia's largest finance companies. IU Pay is focused on product innovation to maintain market leadership, provide access to new customers, and to develop new revenue streams. Next slide. The business is very much focused on a measured approach to sustainable growth. The credit markets in Southeast Asia are far less sophisticated than Western markets like Australia, and a more conservative approach is required. We know what works in Southeast Asia, having operated in the banking and digital payment space for nearly 20 years. Next slide. The market opportunity for BNPL in Malaysia is large and growing with gross merchandise value in 2021 of 287 million US dollars. And it's predicted to grow at nearly 50% compound annual growth rate. Our current market share is 4% by volume with a medium term target of 10%. 
45% of Malaysia's population is serviced by banks, and our target market is the top two thirds of that. Next slide. We are currently operating in Malaysia, but our goal is to expand throughout Southeast Asia. The region's economic growth and uplift in incomes, along with high adoption rates for new technologies, is providing significant opportunities for creative fintech solutions. Next slide. Central to the company's strategy is establishing relationships with partners who manage large communities of merchants and consumers. Partnering with payment gateways facilitates efficient acquisition of merchants and streamlined technology integration. Our partners' interests are aligned with the company, providing additional oversight and management of merchant performance. In September this year, the company announced its first collaboration with a major Malaysian retail bank and is working to further leverage its relationships with the finance sector. Next slide. Product development is key to maintaining market leadership and generating new revenue opportunities. The company has developed a number of initiatives over the last 12 months. The co-branded My IOU Cash Plus Visa prepaid card is a potential game changer for My IOU. Once integrated to the My IOU platform, it will allow consumers to make purchases anywhere Visa is accepted and then convert those purchases into instalment payment plans. The key objectives of the initiative include to provide access to many more merchants, to drive growth in new consumers and enhance brand loyalty, and to generate additional revenue streams via potential future product enhancements. The rollout was launched in July and it's progressing well. Next slide. Another enhancement to our product capabilities is obtaining certification for Sharia compliance, which is preferred by the large Islamic communities of Southeast Asia. In July, certification was confirmed and a partnership agreement was signed with Pay Halal, a Sharia compliant payment gateway. The company's first Sharia BNPL transactions were processed in early September. Sharia compliance and Islamic finance product capabilities provide a number of strategic growth opportunities. It opens access to new communities of consumers and merchants, positions the company to develop opportunities with Islamic banks and MBFIs, pre-positions the company for territory expansion into countries with large Islamic populations, and more broadly diversifies the company's offerings across the regulated credit markets. Next slide. The other major strategic initiative over the past year involves the investment in IDSB, which has resulted in IE Pay acquiring a 34% stake in that business. IDESTINASI, or IDSB, is a specialised finance company established for over 40 years in Malaysia. IDSB is a consumer loan processing agent for banks with civil servant customers. In Malaysia, there are approximately 1.5 million civil servants. IDSB has a unique collections capability with its customer base that effectively eliminates credit risk, providing it with a competitive advantage over traditional lenders. The investment has compelling fundamentals with a unique competitive advantage, low capital needs with long-term recurring revenues and significant growth potential. More importantly, the investment in IDSB has been made with the bigger picture in mind. It opens access to IDSB's high credit quality customers, and it broadens the base of consumer finance and collections capabilities to meet IU Pay's longer term vision as a leading payment processor with diversified revenues. Next slide. Since we made our initial investment in IDSB, we have continued to collaborate and in September announced a, a strategic partnership agreement this is all about leveraging the close relationship with our investment partner to unlock commercial opportunities for diversified growth. We've already got our first project underway under the agreement. It is a local market first, short-term bridging loan product for new federal government employees. Strategically, the bridging loan will help secure customers for IDSB and both companies are set to benefit. This is the first of what the company believes will be a series of initiatives to develop a broader base of consumer finance offerings with recurring revenue streams. IU Pay benefits not just from the new products, but also via its strategic shareholding in IDSB. Next slide. Based on the presentation I've been through today, 
IUPAY has a clear established pathway to profitability. The first year from launch of the MyU BNPL offering was about building the base of merchants and strategic partnerships and proving the product model and credit risk framework in the Malaysian marketplace. We are now well into the second phase and seeking to build critical mass with interim debt facilities and preparations for expansion into a second jurisdiction in Southeast Asia. Phase three will be all about scaling up with expansion based upon wholesale debt funding and growth across jurisdictions with innovative product offerings. In summary, IUPAY is a well-established fintech operating in the high growth markets of Southeast Asia with a range of product opportunities to drive the business expansion going forward. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Paul. Um, a few questions here. Um, just going back at the beginning of COVID for us, we ran a buy now, pay later webinar. It was the biggest webinar we ever had. We had over a thousand people online, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And and since then, the sector's been hit. The, the industry's been hit by talk of competition, regulation, funding issues, <laughs> et cetera. Where, where do you... How's the perception of the industry in Malaysia and, and how is sentiment going to change here in Australia? Well, uh, IU Pay is a lot, a lot more than just buy now, pay later. We're, we're looking at um, all forms of short-term consumer finance and particularly um, instalment plans to comply with um, uh, Sharia requirements. So um, there are issues in terms of uh, the public perception of buy now, pay later. Um, we believe that we, our business has been set up in a way that, uh, and our product lines um, uh, are established to be as um, very fair and reasonable to the consumers. We're targeting um, uh, high credit quality customers, working with strategic partners. So um, we're not going after top line growth, seeking to um, just generate um, uh, large revenues off the back of high volumes of unsophisticated borrowers who may be um, uh, extending themselves. So we're very particular about um, our product structures and the uh, customers that we're targeting. Um, there is um, uh, there is some significant growth in in the region with the product generally. Um, and the regulators in Malaysia are, are looking to um, uh, establish a new um, Consumer Credit Act. And the intention, I believe, is that um, buy now, pay later will be um, brought in and regulated within that Consumer Credit Code. Uh, we welcome regulation. We believe that'll be good for the sector and the, and the, the product set. Um, uh, we believe that our the products that we've got uh, are well um, are going to suit um, and and fit within the the anticipated regulatory frameworks. Um, and just as uh, recently, Singapore has has brought out a um, some guidelines in terms of how BNPL should operate. We've been through those, and we believe that we comply with those. Um, so we think we're well well positioned to um, move forward in light of competition and regulation. Thank you. And um, there's a question here, is the digital banking space a, a pathway you'd consider? Uh, well, we've got a long history in terms of digital payment processing, um, authentic authentication of digital payments. Um, so we've got the relationships there. Um, there's certainly um, potential for us to be involved in that space um, as to the exact um, nature of our role. At this stage, it would be around um, the FinTech solutions um, rather than the full service um, you know, lending proposition. And, and what about the cost to acquire uh, customers? That seems to be um, one of the big impediments to the buy now, pay later space. It seems to be expensive. How, how do you manage that? Well, I think that's where our focus is on strategic partners. Um, um, ac accessing uh, customer sets through that through those routes, um, and that's how we, in terms of ac efficient access of uh, acquisition of merchants, but also uh, consumers. Um, so, part recently we announced a um, partnership with um, uh, Bank Simpanan National. It's a large retail bank, and uh, collaborating with partners like uh, a retail bank. 
um, and also our investment into IDSB to access um, high credit quality customers certainly lowers the customer acquisition cost. And uh, Paul, just finally, what's what's the pathway in terms of time frame look like to profitability? Uh, we haven't announced any um, forecast on that, um, so I won't do that here now. Um, but we've certainly got a clear um, a path in terms of the milestones that we need to hit. Um, the portfolio is uh, generating cash, and we believe the product model is working. Um, we've got uh, our our strategy of targeting um, particular strategic targeting of customer communities, consumer communities, um, is working in that our our credit quality is good with a low uh, non-performing loan level. Um, it's still modest, and um, so that's sort of one of the main metrics that we we monitor. Um, so we're all about now, now that we've been proving up the model and the business framework, we're all about now looking to build scale. Um, and that's what's going to get us to the um, that break even point and beyond. Great, Paul. That's all we have time for. Appreciate your time. Um, we'll catch up with you probably next year. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. Thanks, everyone. That's all we have time for. Enjoy your weekend. I believe the sun's out, maybe not in Melbourne. But uh, we'll see you again next week. See you.